good afternoon. So today I was uh, working on some Herbie Hancock lines from his solo off of One Finger Snap, and I thought it would be a cool idea to share some of it with you, you know, like break down some of the lines and try and find some common devices that he's using to perhaps help demystify some of his amazing playing here um, and hopefully apply it to your own. So I'm going to play it for you first. This is the first two choruses off of uh, his original recording of this tune. And I have the speed definitely slowed down here. The original is super fast, but you'll definitely be able to hear the lines probably more clear slowed down. But I'll also admit I definitely haven't gotten it clean up to the original speed yet. So here it is slowly. <laughs> everything lick by lick um, so the first thing I want to do is I just want to briefly go over the uh, chord progression or the harmonic structure just so you for those of you who aren't familiar it's probably best to just look up the chart online if you don't have it in front of you but the cool thing about this tune is harmonically I feel like it kind of has both ends of the harmonic spectrum because the first 12 measures it starts off very modal but then the last state, it goes into more of a, I guess you might call it traditional jazz harmony with uh, lots of two fives and two five ones and stuff like that. Okay, so just to go through it really quickly, uh, the first 12 measures, like I said, it's more modal where you're breaking it up into three groupings of four measures at a time where you're, for each one of those four measures, there's just playing one chord. And they're all kind of the, have the same thing going on, which is basically... Um, so, for example, the first chord, in my book, I write down both G minor 7 and C7, but most of you probably know it's kind of like the 2 and the 5 chord. Um, they're, you can really treat them like the same, it's the same sound. So if you were to improvise on this chord yourself, you know, you could think um, G Dorian or C Mixolydian, which is obviously the same thing. Um, I typically, when I kind of tend to think of them as interchangeable. Typically, the dominant sound, I'm thinking of it as more of like a dominant seven suspended. You know, if the dominant was more of like an altered sound, then I might play something different. But when you're trying to kind of give that dominant suspended sound, um, it's definitely, in my opinion, very similar to the Dorian with the corresponding two, the two chord. So the first one, like I said, the first four measures, C7 or um, G minor seven. Next four measures, you got the same thing, but it's B flat minor seven or E flat seven suspended. Um, then the next four measures is E flat minor seven or A flat seven suspended. Okay. Now the last eight measures, this is where it goes into the more traditional stuff. So it starts off, it's um, one chord per measure. So it starts off with two consecutive two fives, so uh, minor two fives. So G half diminished to C7, F half diminished to B flat seven, and then landing, the next two measures are on uh, E flat major seven, landing on the one there, which is where you'd expect. And then the last two measures, um, are two five minor two five D half diminished um, G seven leading back to the top, which in that case because it's like leading into a C seven, you could almost think like oh like maybe C is the sound of the chord. Is it like you know like is it C seven or G minor? But when you're playing over it again, you can think both. All right, so that's the harmonic structure. So um, I'm gonna kind of just ramble through this. I don't exactly know what I'm gonna say. But let's just go through it um, line by line. So, the first in the first chorus, all the lines that he's playing for these modal chords, um, 
they're actually, when you look at what he's doing, they're very um, straightforward and they're really not that complex in a lot of ways. But I think the reason why they sound good is number one, because I mean, they're fast and they're in time and they're harmonically correct. Never underestimate that. You know, if you're in time and the harmony is correct, a lot of times like that alone will obviously make the music sound good. But in terms of what he's actually playing, it's really not that um, crazy. So for the uh, G minor 7, he's starting on beat 2, on or measure 2 on beat 3. So it's like 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2. Okay? And the first thing I want to point out, because you're going to see this a lot in this solo, he does a lot of enclosures, okay? And um, the cool thing, too, is like, the chromatic notes that he's um, using in the enclosure, the notes that he's starting on, he's actually playing them on downbeats where you would typically maybe expect chord tones, um, but he makes it work, which has a very interesting sound to it. So if we think like G minor, G Dorian, let's actually make it harmonic minor. That's really what he's playing around. So he's just starting it with this enclosure. You know, very chromatic, um, cliche stuff. And then just answering it with that. So here he's playing the major seven, but that's almost like an enclosure in and of itself too. And then answering it with that, okay? But really, with the exception of those enclosures, he's really just kind of playing an ascending scale line. Okay, so really nothing that crazy. Just straight outlining the harmony, okay? Now, the next four measures, when he goes to B flat, minor seven, he's starting on measure two, beat two, I think. So, one, two, three, four, one. Okay. Now, here, again, also pretty straightforward. Um, if you think B flat minor, especially now, you may not be a guitar player watching this, but if you are a guitar player, this traditional B flat minor seven shape right here, it everything just fits nicely if you just think about the shapes that relate to it. So if you think about this shape, all he's doing is he's just adding that 13 and the 9 there. So he's doing this line where it's like, and then answering it. Okay, but still pretty diatonic. And when he answers it at the end, he's just kind of playing around very shortly with those motifs. You know, this whole thing, that can be obviously expanded to the scale, but he only does it a little bit. So still, just really, just very simply outline the changes. Okay. Then the next four measures, he goes to E flat minor 7. Okay. Again, extremely simple. Okay. Now obviously if you're thinking E flat minor, in this case probably Dorian, you know, a mode that relates to that would be F Phrygian. And the only reason why I say that is, again, with guitar players, you tend to learn, obviously all these modal patterns are interchangeable. Like you can say the pattern that you would typically know is F Phrygian is still E flat Dorian. So that's what I'm thinking here. I'm just pulling from the traditionally known F Phrygian scale pattern on guitar. And I'm just sliding into this with this uh, chromatic note. So that's just straight up F Phrygian pattern. And again, keep in mind, it's the rhythm, even though he's really just kind of playing a simple ascending line, then descending a little bit and ending with this motif. Um, but very simple, okay? And it's the rhythm that makes it good. And keep in mind also the space with this phrasing that he's leaving in between the lines. You know, the rhythm is good and the space that he's leaving is good, okay? So that's the modal part of uh, the first chorus. So now, when we get into the two fives, so this first line, this is a great line, and this is one that you should definitely learn. If I play the two in a row, it's, you know, one, two. Well, I went into the end there too, but, so let's look at it. So the first part, again, we have a measure each of the G half diminished, and then the C7, and he plays this, one, two. Landing on this, the next measure. Okay, and it's actually really not that crazy harmonically. First part, he's starting on the second half of the measure, and he's literally just outlining the, the arpeggio, G half diminished. Um, okay, then the next note, you're gonna be in the C7. 
Um, and what he's doing there, he's starting with just like a seven flat nine. It's like this is the major third of C, flat nine, root, okay? So that's one and two and. Now the rhythm he's doing here is actually really cool the way it fits because he's doing this. Okay, so what that would be, it would be like one and two and three E and a four and one. So he's like tying that last, that upbeat of beat two to the downbeat of beat three. And then he's playing the last two sixteenth notes of beat three there. And then four and one and landing on that. So, okay. Um, so that one again, one, two. Okay, then the next two five, the F half diminished to B flat seven. Okay, and it sounds very almost um, cliche bebop. So, yeah, so he's starting on the chord tone here, it's the minor third of the F half diminished, but then he's going this C major triad. And the way I would think of it is this um, if F is like your half diminished but if you thought of it as a regular minor or you thought of it as like melodic minor or harmonic minor obviously the five chord in relationship to that would be c7 or c so that's where that c major triad is coming from so he's kind of changing the half diminished into like a regular minor or like a melodic minor type sound which is totally cool because harmonically speak like the chords are still cadencing the same way the roots are still the same so He's and then going into another enclosure, leading to this, which is a um, chord tone, um, and landing on that. Now this is the B flat seven. So again, very typical bebop stuff. He's just chord tone, leading into another chord tone. One and two and three, you know, seven to third. Okay, again, it's just very um traditional stuff there, but it's great and it fits. And then he'll land on the E flat major chord with that, which is the fifth of E flat major. And then this line too, very um, cliche like major line. Okay, so that thing all together, one, two. Okay, it's great. So I definitely recommend learning that line if nothing else. Okay, then the end of the chorus, he has that minor 2-5, back to C7, he's playing this. And then that's the top right there. So he's doing, you know, starting with a chromatic passing tone, leading into a chord tone, which is the uh, third of the D half diminished, just going up straight D locally in scale, landing on this, which is a chord tone of the G7, the third. Now here... It's kind of just leading into this, but it's really, it's part of like a G um, Dorian scale or C Mixolydian scale for the most part. Um, so he's already kind of in the uh, the next chord leading into it there. Okay, so that's the top. All right, so now we're at chorus two. So for the C7 G minor here, he plays this. Okay. So let's break that down. So it starts with these little intervallic jumps. It almost sounds more like C7 to me than G minor. That, that, that whole thing is almost like an enclosure leading up to this. Okay, now once he lands in here, again, if you think G minor, he's doing another enclosure. Now this is another cool one where he's going. Okay, he's starting with a triad, like a D major triad and then chromatic notes. It's all leading up into this, this G, okay, which is a chord tone. And just as a side note, an interesting point is like, again, I'm trying to pull things out of this solo to learn from it. It's really cool how he has all these different enclosures or chromatic or just different ways of leading into chord tones and starting with that. And once he's at the chord tone, then the lines can actually be simpler, but the, it's almost like you play this cool, interesting line that led into it, and then you can kind of just... Um, keep it very diatonic. I'm not saying that's what he's doing, but, you know, it's an interesting way to think about it. So, all that to lead to this. Now, here he's going, he's starting going up G minor, okay, just straight up ascending the scale. 
Now he's going to do something that's very interesting that we can really take a device from. So he's going, and then going into this. So what is that? Okay, so these notes, the way I'm hearing that is I really just see that as a D Lydian um, sound or chord or arpeggio, whatever. And then landing on that. So here's why I think that works, okay? Because obviously D Lydian doesn't traditionally relate to like a G minor Dorian sound or like a C7 sound. But a lot of times people will do things, and a lot of you probably know this, where if you have space on a chord, you can insert other chords in between based off of what they're leading into, and it can you insert a chord that would make sense in terms of what it's leading into. So because the chord coming up is B flat minor, um, obviously a chord that relates to B flat minor is D flat major, okay? If this is like a, the Dorian chord, this is like the Lydian chord. So when I play D Lydian, it's like a chromatic half step up. So it's just kind of chromatically passing into that. So harmonically, it's like he's thinking like G minor seven, you know, then D leading into D flat major or B flat minor, which is kind of like the same thing. So that's kind of what I think he's thinking there. Okay, so that whole part. Now, another cool thing is this. When he lands on this, this is the start of the B flat minor. Okay? Now, you can see that as an enclosure because you're basically leading up to this chord tone, which is the fifth of B flat. But the really interesting thing about this is he's starting on this, which in relationship to B flat is actually the major third, which makes no sense. It's the wrong chord tone. And it's on a downbeat, too. So that's really interesting how that actually sounds good because typically that's not a good thing to do but it just sounds good. Also maybe because what's coming before it. Okay, so it's pretty interesting. So um, so when he's on the B flat, yeah, he's doing typical B flat stuff. You know, pulling from the arpeggios basically. Then he's going into doing the same thing as what he kind of did before with these inserted chords um, that chromatically pass. So you know we're leading into E flat minor but he plays these E minor ideas. You know. That's very E minor to me. And because it's leading into E flat minor, okay? So same device there, and it sounds really good, especially again when it's up to tempo and in time and everything. So now for E flat minor or A flat seven, um, he plays this. And it can kind of go either way again, like how you hear it. I sort of tend to think of that more as like A flat mixolydian with some chromatic passing tones. You know, 11 to 4. Or actually, I'm sorry, 3rd third, third to root. So chord tones chromatically passing to other chord tones. And then little enclosures. And then sort of like a similar motif to what he did before. So, pretty diatonic there, just with some chromaticism. Okay, now we get to one of these really cool lines in the solo. For those of you who are familiar with it, you probably agree that this is a cool little line. So, when we get to the two fives again, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So he does this thing, one, two. goes on but let's start with the first part um, I'm not gonna probably go too much into the the ending of it but just this last part here this is a cool device to look at so most of you again probably know when we do have the two fives here the two chords again they're diatonic and related so even if we have a G half diminished preceding this C7 if you wanted to play a line over those chords you really could in a lot of situations just think C7 for the whole thing because they really are related or C7 altered. So if we think C7 and we think of the um, dominant diminished um, relationship, a lot of you probably know that the whole half uh, diminished scale that starts a whole step below the root of that works. So if we have C7, that would be like a, 
B, uh, B flat whole half diminished. The that works over C7. So these notes over here, it's basically coming from that. All right, and what I think makes this line sound good is the specific groupings of numbers of notes that he's using here and that repetitive rhythm. And it's starting on an upbeat because it's six notes, one, two, three, four, five, six, but it's actually starting on an upbeat, on the upbeat of two, one, two. Okay, and then he keeps that pattern going but it's time basically to move it to the next chord because it's gonna to change to this other two five. So now, because we just thought C7 and we did that, now we have B flat seven, so you can really just take that and move it down a whole step, which is what he does. And then he sort of starts at the same, it's a little different, like a variation, but he kind of just answers it and ends the line. there you know that whole thing it's kind of hard to determine like um where the e flat starts i think maybe here whatever but then he goes in that d minor uh d half diminished g7 you know, kind of like a minor 2-5 to end it there, and then he goes up and obviously the solo continues. Um, so I kind of butchered that ending there, but really the cool device to take from it is the use of those uh, diminished scales and applying it to the whole 2-5. And it's cool because, especially in this case, when you have two consecutive 2-5s that come up, you can kind of just take a pattern and just move them down sequentially, in this case, in, in whole steps and the fact that you're kind of playing this repetitive pattern I think gives it a cool sound so um, I guess we'll leave it at that and you know again try and just look at some of the main devices here specifically a lot of these enclosure things and it's a lot of times it's interesting how they're actually starting on downbeats but even after the enclosures he's just doing very simple diatonic scale runs and just very small embellishments nothing too crazy if you really break it down um, stuff like that you know, just keeping it simple, but again, in time. And like I said before, in the second course, um, where when you do have space in like modal situations, how you can insert chromatic passing chords in between that will be leading into the chord that you're going to. So, some definitely some interesting stuff here, and uh, I hope you enjoyed that. So, yeah.